If you're a fan of African American fiction, then I know the work of our guest today on Another View is in your collection. We're spending the hour talking with New York Times best-selling author Omar Tyree. With more than two million books sold in the genres of fiction, business, and children, and eight million readers, Omar Tyree is now venturing into the world of mystery thriller books. So how did this former football player become a best-selling author in the first place? What advice does he have for you budding authors listening to today's show? I'm Barbara Ham Lee. Another View is next with author Omar Tyree, right after this news from NPR. Discussing the issues and celebrating the successes of the African American community. This is Another View. Happy Friday, everyone. Welcome to Another View. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. Before we get into today's show, let me take a moment to say thank you, thank you, thank you to everyone who showed their support for Another View last Friday by becoming a member of WHRV. We actually raised $6,000 during the hour. Yes. <laughs> and so on behalf of producer Lisa Godley, audio engineer Perry Smith, myself, and everyone at WHRV FM, we are so very grateful. Your support keeps our show on the air, and it's not too late to give if you're still so inclined. Just visit whrv.org and point, click, and contribute, and thank you again. Now, how does a man who grew up in the Philadelphia, Delaware region, played football for the University of Pittsburgh, where he was told that football players don't write, transferred to Howard University, got a degree in print journalism, and became a reporter, transform himself into a New York Times best-selling author, lecturer, consultant, and entrepreneur. Well, let's ask him. Please welcome to Another View, Arthur Omar Tyree. Omar, how are you? Hey, thanks for having me on the show. <laughs> we are very excited to have you. Do you remember what it felt like when you hit the New York Times bestseller list? I was in business mode, so I was thinking about the next book and looking at it as a stepping stone to bigger and better things. You know, when you're ambitious like that, you look at that as something that you had a goal to do. Mm -hmm. And so it wasn't a jumping up and down moment for me. It was more of, a, okay, now we can do this. Now we're set up to do that. You know, so I was definitely one of those goal getters that was already planned in the next execution. The next step. So you didn't even have just a little bit of that, man, I made it kind of feeling. I had more of a I told you so feeling because I had set that thing up. When I hit the New York Times bestsellers list, I did nine months of promotion. That was for the Fly Girl sequel mm -hmm. uh, for the love of money that came out August the 15th, 2000. And I pushed that date for nine months, August the 15th, August the 15th. I put it on T-shirts. I put it on flyers. I had keychains. I had bookmarks. I had all types of stuff that promoted it. And at the time, a lot of booksellers were not into a specific date promotion. Mm -hmm. They would just say, oh, it comes out next month. It comes out, you know, next uh, Wednesday or something. I had a specific date that I promoted for nine months, and I was telling the publishers that people are used to dates. If you think about films, and at the time, music, everything came out on a specific, you know, a particular mm -hmm. date. And so I wanted to copy that, and so when it finally hit, it wasn't a jumping up and down thing for me. It was more of I told you so. Now let's go, bit, you know, get back to business. So it was one of those, <laughs> one of those deals where you you wanted it to happen, and when it did, you were not surprised. You looked at it like, yes, it worked. Now let's keep this thing rocking. Yeah, you had a, several of those kind of I told you so moments in your career. Um, even back when you were in college in Pittsburgh, where they told you, you know, you're you're a man, you're playing football. What's this writing thing all about? Yeah, and then a lot of those guys now call me up and say, hey, man, I got a book idea. Let's write it together, you know. <laughs> you know Nothing so like happens. success. Uh, you know, if you're not going to be, you know, following in someone's footsteps or if you're not looking at somebody who's a role model in that, you know, situation, you become the role model. You become the first one. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I was the first one in a lot of situations, and I was not afraid of being the first one. And that's a good message to everyone out there listening. Sometimes you're not going to have someone that comes before you. Sometimes you have to create the path, and we can't be afraid of that. Absolutely. So when did you know that you wanted to be a writer? What, what was your driving force? So 
sophomore year in college at the University of Pittsburgh. My freshman year, you know, I was getting the grades in English, and I was doing English papers that were excellent. I was helping other students in their English papers. But it wasn't until that sophomore year where I said, you know what, I should do this for a living. And then I went ahead and uh, transferred from a uh, pharmacy major in Pittsburgh to Howard University with a new mission and a goal to become a writer. Hmm. So it didn't come from when you were like a little boy thinking, I like to tell stories or... Not at all. I was a football that. player, a typical African-American male who wanted to go pro in the NFL, and I was thinking strictly football, and I went to the University of Pittsburgh because it's a big-time football school, the Big East Pit Panthers and all of that, right. and I wanted to play football, and then when I got there... The same year I, I entered college in 1987, the NFL had a strike. And when they had a strike, they had several football players at the college level who jumped into the pro league because they were looking for players to fill out these teams. And we had several players that left the University of Pittsburgh. And how about we had the most vocal coach against it? And so our hmm. coach from Pittsburgh was the most vocal coach. And out of all the schools, just imagine this, all the colleges in America – our coach ended up being the most vocal about these guys shouldn't have had the chance to do that, and it was an atrocity to the league and all that. And I'm walking around campus knowing that every guy that plays football wants to go pro, and now the coach is smashing them because they had an opportunity to go pro early because of this strike that the NFL had where they needed players. Mm -hmm. And I looked at that and I said, you got to be kidding me. And a whole lot of these guys were not going to class. They were not getting an education. They were there to play football. And then the coach was stripping that away from them when they went pro, which that was the reason why all of them were playing ball in the first place. And so that was my awakening to the politics of, you know, the uh, college and athletic arena. And it really turned me off. Mm -hmm. And I had a lot to say about it, which I still do. You know, so that was the impetus of that first book, Colored on White Campus, where I talked about scholarships and athletes and education and impoverishment and having opportunities and not having opportunities and all the inequalities that you learn about once you step on that college well. Mm -hmm. So, Omar, for those of, in my listening audience who may not be familiar with your work, how would you describe your, your fiction writing now? I know you have several genres, and we'll get to that. But in terms of your fiction, how would you describe it? I'm Before. a journalistic writer, okay. and I've been saying that for years. I have a degree in journalism from Howard University, and my writing will adapt to what subject I want to write about. And so that first subject was about college education, racism, you know, and all of that. The mm -hmm. second book I wrote, which became famous, was Fly Girl. That was about inner-city materialism in the 1980s hip-hop era. My third book I wrote about Capital City. Washington, D.C. was called the murder capital for three straight years because the drug territory for young black men got so vicious where they all were killing each other for drug territory. And so I wrote about capitalism and violence in America with that book, Capital City. Mm -hmm. The next book I wrote was A Do Right Man, where by that time, it was the early 1990s, Terry McMillan came out with a book called Waiting to Exhale, yes. which was the third book. A lot of people miss Mama. A lot of people miss Disappearing Acts. But by the third book, Waiting to Exhale, the nation was ready, and she blew up the marketplace with that book, and a whole lot of women copied her. But a lot of the material that was coming out was women having bad choices in men and then writing about it. And so I had to protect the men in the community by writing this book, <laughs> A Do Right Man, and remind sisters that they are good men in the community, but we typically get more credence and talk about the bad guys more. You know, so I wrote that book. Then I wrote a book called Single Mom, where we had 71% of African-American households of single mother households. And so I wrote a book about a single mother who had two boys from two different relationships, and then she had a third man who was trying to take on her in a relationship where she already had two sons, and so they call them the ready-made families. And now she's a super mom doing everything by herself, where women typically say, I can do bad by myself. Yeah, but do you want to? Don't you still want to be in a family? And so I wrote about single moms in that book. Mm -hmm. Then I wrote a book called Sweet St. Louis about black-on-black -black love because a lot of the books that were coming out from our community were all negative books, all smash and crash and drama books. In fact, BET used to have a show called Old Drama where they talked about all kind of dramatic stuff going on in the community. Now TMZ has upscaled that to this new thing where they talk about all the drama of celebrities. And so every book, if you go to my website, you can read all of them. Omar Tyree, 
O M A R T Y R E E dot com. And you also every single book that I've ever published has always had a particular subject and a particular mission that mm-hmm. I wanted to talk about and address in the community. And a lot of people who don't know my work, they don't understand that. But every time I get a chance to explain it, I explain it very clearly. I'm a journalistic writer, and I have always written to explain the African American community and everything that's going on with us. Four four zero two six six five or one eight hundred. 940-2240 are the numbers to call. Are you a budding author out there listening to the show today? Would you like some advice from Omar Tyree? Give us a call at 440-2665 or 1-800-940-2240. So, Omar, in the 90s, you were among that the genre of people, um, you know, black authors who were really doing the same thing that you're talking about, writing about contemporary black life as opposed to our authors before who really maybe focused on more of the civil rights movement and so forth. Your genre focused on what was happening today. But yet you have a new series out now called the Traveler series, and it takes a completely different turn. You want to talk about that a little bit? Well, for the most part, I have now written 20 books Mm -hmm. about African-American life, and I'm not into being redundant. So once I write about a subject, I'm not going to write four books about single moms. I'm not going to write five books about, you know, do-right men. I'm not going to write eight books about sexuality. I'm not not into that. As a journalist, I was a parachute journalist that I always wanted to write big stories, and I would get bored if you you asked me to follow up on the same story I already wrote about. You know, I'm not into that. In fact, they have what they call beat writers, where they only write about, you know, one subject. One subject, right. I was mm-hmm. a reporter that you could send on any subject. You know what I mean? I was the one that you, you paid what we call, big money. Yeah, we, Omar, you, go get the story. We called and you so a general assignment case, reporter. <laughs> <laughs> right. So with mm-hmm. that being the case, the Traveler series, I said, you know what? I have already written about everything I can write about within America. I want to travel and see the world. I want to write about a character now that travels around the world and can report all these different cultures and people and the things that they're going through. And this guy just happens to get in trouble everywhere he goes, and he finds beautiful women everywhere he goes as well. And so you think about the James Bond series. This mm-hmm. guy is always going to different countries, fighting against different villains from different, you know, backgrounds and communities. But he really doesn't get involved in the community itself. A lot of times it's just fighting the villain in a different place. I wanted to get involved with the people from those places, but I had to create a character. Problem is, a lot of my readership, African Americans, could only relate to the urban settings of America. And so that was an issue for me. And every time I brought it up with a publisher, they looked at it and said, Omar, you have an urban audience of African Americans. They don't travel. What do they want to know about Africa? What do they want to know about China? What do they want to know about Brazil? What do they want to know about Colombia? What do they want to know about Russia? You don't have the audience for that. And so it took us years to find a publisher who was willing to allow the idea to germinate. But the catch-22 was that if we don't have African Americans who are interested in this idea, then what's your main character going to be? So if I started off with an African American character, knowing how white America, for whatever reason, they still can't connect to African American stories unless it's Will Smith in a movie. They tend to like him. But if it's not Will Smith in a movie, I had to turn it into a white character so white America can connect to it and I can have a bigger mainstream audience who do travel, who do think about the world. And Mm. so I said, well, if I do that now, am I going to alienate my African-American readers? And so we came up with the idea that this guy has a mentor and a protector, so to speak, with a black woman who understands that this guy needs guidance, and the black woman works for the guy's father, and the guy's father is a wealthy guy that, you know, is still leery about the son traveling around the world and getting into trouble. And so I said, since most of the people that read my book are black women anyway, because a lot of black men are still not into the reading thing, I mm-hmm. said, that's where we can keep our black women audience and at the same time stretch out to a mainstream white audience with a white character. Well, and then me- if you're thinking about doing films, that connects to the film atmosphere as well because white film characters get a lot more film ideas and a lot more pictures than African-American guys do unless you have Will Smith in your pocket. And I don't have Will Smith in my pocket. <laughs> well, let me, there's two things that, that came up out of what you just said, though. First of all, how did you feel when, when publishers would say, well, African-Americans don't travel? I mean, that's, that's, that was kind of a stereotype, don't you think? The reality is, I asked African-Americans myself about the series, and they were not interested. A lot of times we jump to conclusions 
you know, and, and summations. Like when I first had my publishing deals, a lot of people would assume that white publishers somehow controlled what you wrote. And so they would always ask me, oh, Mars, there's certain things that the white publishers won't allow you to write about. And I said, look here, if you write about anything that makes money, they are happy and jumping up and down. They don't care. And so I had to keep educating people. No, they are not the uh, the police that are at these publishing companies that tell you, no, you can't write that, you can't write this. If it makes money, they're like, great, let's write another one. Let's write another one. They are mm -hmm. in it to make money. Mm -hmm. And so I said, no, there's no police here. And so, yeah, when I went to into the idea of this travel series, I had to ask the people, say, hey, if I wrote a series about this, that, and other thing, and the first thing that will come out of nine out of ten black folks' mouths, Oh, well, I've never been there. I don't know if I can. But they they just didn't have any interest in it. And so mm. the publishers, they were on point. They don't travel. They're not thinking about the world like that. They're thinking about what's around the corner from them. They're thinking about things that they can already relate to. And that's a word that has been killing me for years because we have too many African American readers who want to relate instead of learn instead mm. of explore, instead of wander. And that's what books should allow you to do. You're supposed to expand your brain, not read the same stuff that you're already familiar with. If you're in Virginia, you just want to read about Virginia people. If I live in Philadelphia, I just want to read about Philadelphian people. And so it gets yeah. ridiculous to a point, and sometimes, you know, African Americans can get upset with me, but I've always spoke the truth, and my books always speak the truth. And so, like <laughs> Sister Soldier said, if the truth hurts, you'll be in pain because we need to hear it. Yeah, we do need to hear the truth. Well, let me ask you this now you have an author for example like a james patterson who writes about alex cross clearly alex cross is an african-american character even though he right. doesn't really say it in the book could you not have written um traveler so that if your character was african-american that he would still appeal like alex cross does to a mainstream uh who audience? writes alex cross okay <laughs> is, is he an african-american no, he is not. <laughs> now, let me tell you something. But mm -hmm. I lived in, in uh, Delaware before I moved down to Charlotte, North Carolina. James Patterson was popular back then. And I was reading reports where a lot of his white readers, they were upset that he continued to push this Alice Cross. And he told them in interviews, I am going to continue writing about this character. I like this character. And then he had some black folks that was asking about the authenticity of that character because he was a white guy writing about a black character. And he said, look, hmm. black people are not all the same. I own this black character. I'm going to make him do what I want him to do. And I'm not going to be, you know, ignorant to African-American culture, but I can, and you know, incorporate a black character just because I'm a white. And so he had those, and this was back in the late 90s. 98, 99. Mm -hmm. And so this was a long time ago, but he kept doing it because he was hard-headed and he wanted to present that character, and that's what he was able to do. But he's still a white male, and so he still had an audience that still sided with him, and he could still get in, you know, certain doors and write in such a way that, you know, it's still uh, outside of what I'm doing. So now I have to go ahead and redevelop myself to appeal to more of a mainstream uh, you know, I guess they call it white American audience and international audience. That's more important because mm -hmm. I'm going to be writing about people all around the world. So I want to get to that international audience where ebooks now allow you to attract an international audience. And so I'm excited by this. But don't, you know, get disillusioned. James Patterson had to go through the same nonsense. And even with that recent movie where he casted uh, uh, Tyler, Tyler Perry, Perry. Mm -hmm. instead of Idris Elba which I read that article, and he said in, in straight words that he's going with Tyler Perry because Tyler Perry has a bigger audience, and he feels that he can sell it. But I thought about that, and I said, yeah, but Tyler Perry has church women, and this is a very violent book, and I don't see church women going to a very violent movie. I don't care if it's Tyler Perry or not. And so sometimes you have to know exactly what you're doing. But James Patterson, he's making tons and tons and millions of dollars through doing a lot of different ideas, but he has the right audience. And he's still a white American male. Mm hmm. Four four zero two six six five or one eight hundred nine four zero two two four zero are the numbers to call. Have you read any of Omar Tyree's books? Give us a call and let's talk about it. So, Omar, let's read um, an excerpt from The Traveler. Do you have something you want to share with us? Oh, you caught me off guard with that. I don't have an excerpt ready. I'm just ready to talk. If you have something you want to read and you got a great reading voice, you go ahead and get it. But for the people that want to read an excerpt, mm -hmm. here's what you do. You go to the website, thetravelerbooks.com, and we have a whole website set up for you so you can understand the entire series, where I'm going with it, what we're doing next. Uh, we have a blog set up with Twitter for the, the character. His name is Gary Stevens uh, from Louisville, Kentucky. And so you can read the excerpt again at 
thetravelerbooks, plural, dot com. Dot com. And you can see everything right there, but I'm not uh, ready to read the excerpt from it. I'm sorry. Okay, no problem. We can move yep. on then. So when you come up with an idea to write a book, do you live with your characters for a while um, before you actually put them on paper? What's your process? Not really. I'm one of those individuals that I really, I grew up a movie fan, and so I mm-hmm. would study voices and study characters and break them. So I already had that built in. And so it's not something that, it, when I go to the movies, I'm really studying everything that's going on. I'm breaking it. I am really into psychology and sociology. In fact, I got A's in both of those subjects in college. And so if you're a writer and you're writing about people, you better know people, like mm-hmm. the back of your hand. And so typically, if I don't know a person... I'll study the type of person that that person would be. If the guy travels a lot, of course, the first thing I wanted to do, he had to be adventurous. He can't be afraid of anything. Mm -hmm. If he's going to get involved with women, I had to make him sexy and charming and, you know I mean, have that boyish charm that attracts women. If I want to have him, you know, getting out of trouble, he has to be ingenious in a way. He has to be crafty. He has to be rugged. And so you, you create all the character types that you would need to have for this character to be successful and believable within that story that you're telling. And after a while, once you've done this over and over again, it becomes natural. But I don't walk around with the character, you know, like I'm being a character. I just understand people. So when I get into that mind frame where I'm writing the character, I understand exactly what he needs to be and how he needs to respond to certain things. Mm -hmm. And that's what all writers have to do, particularly when you're a writer for life and not just writing one particular book. When you're a writer for life and you're constantly creating characters, you know a lot about people and what makes them tick. Mm -hmm. So where do you get your ideas from then? Well, the idea is, again, I'm a journalist, so I have newspapers right now. I'm going to go out there and I'm going to get a USA Today. I'm going to get a Charlotte uh, Observer. And there's a million stories right there. And so people ask all the time. When I was in journalism class at Howard University, I had one professor that told us, and I will never forget, everything is a story. But it just depends on what stories you're interested in. And so stories are all around us all day long. But if you're not a storyteller, it doesn't mean anything. It's just like musicians. Musicians hear melodies and things all day long, sounds all day long. But if you're not a musician, it doesn't mean anything to you. Same thing with camera people. Camera people can see colors and images and angles all day long. But if you're not a camera people, it doesn't mean anything to you. Well, they're seeing things that you don't see. I call that translation. People Mm -hmm. who are able to translate energy in the world and then shift it into something creative. And so writers are translators, musicians are translators, directors are translators, and other people translate in other forms of of professions. And so that's what I do. I'm always translating stories that make you go, hmm, that's interesting. Let me write a story about that. But it has to be something that really turns me on in a way where I can write three and four hundred pages. Because if it's something that's just, you know, like a, a, a passing a uh, shred or idea that if it's just a short story, 25 pages, and I'm actually going to start writing short stories uh, mm-hmm. in my e-books. Uh, but for the most part, if you're writing novels, it has to be a big idea that you know you can execute. That you can get out there. 440-2665 or 1-800-940-2240. Ali joins us from Norfolk. Hi, Ali. You're on the air. Yes. Um, first of all, since I want to thank Brother uh, Omar for bringing up the point of uh, how we as black people here in America is somewhat are not internationally and globally thinking people when it comes to traveling. Um, I own a bookstore here, a uh, black bookstore here, and I, and trust me, uh, I have a passport. I'm planning to go to Morocco this year. And whenever I discuss any global affairs with black people around the planet, from Papua New Guinea to Australia, wherever, and I, I suggest the uh, Black people all the time, African Americans, look, you know, you need to get your passport and start traveling. 90% or more are just um, objects to the idea. And they say they don't have the money, this and that, but yet they got $180 tennis shoes, they drive a Lexus, they, some of them academia, uh, they make in, some make six figures, I've met, and said they don't want to go overseas. So um, he's 100% correct that uh, for some reason, um, we have the means to travel around the earth. Um, the University of Georgia gives some type of uh, a poll every year on how much money African Americans spend outside the community. Uh, just on hair, the black woman spending 
billions of dollars. So your point, your your point being that that we should travel more often than we than we actually do, and we have right. the uh, the opportunity to do that. Let's of let course. Omar respond. Go ahead, Omar. Yeah, that's excellent. But that's that's the case. You know, I traveled a lot. My kids got a chance to travel very early on in their life. And when they talk about travel to their friends, their friends are like, wow, you able to do that? My kids learned how to ski at age five and eight. And they picked up, what, and these are black kids skiing. It's just typically, oh, black kids skiing? Yeah, we took our kids skiing, and we put them in this little skiing class with the other kids. And our kids are naturally athletic. And I'm talking about in a half a day. My kids were skiing down a mountain by themselves like experts in a half a day of training. And so now they've been skiing their whole life. They're, you know, 17 and uh, 14. Skiing so, their whole life. But they've been able to swim. They've been able to travel. They've been to the islands. They've been to different places. And so I want to continue doing that. Now, when the economy hit, we had to tighten up a little bit. But now when we get back into the things that we want to do, I want to take them to China. I want to take them to Africa. I want to take them to Brazil. And what you do, you give your kids that impetus and that idea that, hey, it's stuff out there that I can get involved in. So my kids right now, they already know that they're going to travel too because their parents allowed them to see the world in that way and not get stuck into D.C. or Philadelphia or Charlotte, North Carolina. You know, so definitely you have to basically teach your kids and your people that there's a big world out there. Go get it. Go do it. And don't be afraid of it. It is all about exposure. If you're just joining us, we're talking with New York Times bestselling author Omar Tyree. His latest works, The Traveler, No Turning Back, and The Traveler, Welcome to Dubai. If you'd like to join our conversation, dial 440-2665 or 1-800-940-2240. So, Omar, talk to me about um, eBook Nation. Because technology has made uh, distributing your work a lot different from when you first started, hasn't it? Well, you know, the bookstores are closing down now. You know, I I spend a lot of time in Washington, D.C. now. I'm actually working on a huge project, the autobiography of Mayor Marion Barry, who Mm. was the infamous mayor of Washington, D.C., who put a lot of black people in powerful positions, and he made the Maryland suburbs the highest income of black people in the country yes. because of all the opportunities Prince George's County, Maryland. black people. And I'm working on his autobiography, mm-hmm. but when I'm in the D.C. area, Washington, D.C. used to be one of the highest uh, bookstore areas in the country, Washington and Maryland. It was bookstores every couple of blocks. Now they shut them all down. Now you might find two bookstores downtown, and then you have to sweep around the suburbs to find some more bookstores. They're shutting down. They just can't function anymore, and now the e-books are taking over. But I thought about it. At first, I didn't like it. I love books. I love the feel of them. I love the smell of them. I love the boxes. I love shelving them. I love the covers. I love everything about physical books. I'm in that entity. Mm -hmm. But now I figured out that the e-book thing, people can download a book, not see you not have to worry about the books not being on the shelf or having back orders and that kind of thing. You don't have a reputation. They can sit there on the phone and and download a book and read it at their leisure, and then the capital comes to you over and over again. And now you can set up your own e-book industry. You don't have to have a publisher at all. And you charge people 5 $6.00. Well, for the most part, even if you had a publishing deal, you were only going to make 2 $3 anyway after the publisher takes that money. So now you can charge 5 $6. Amazon's going to take 30% of that, 35% of that, so you're going to end up with 4 $3 or something like that. Mm-hmm. But now you have the ability to sell your book wherever you want to, and the catch is people can download the book all over the world and don't have to worry about it being there physically. So I thought about it after a while and said, you know what, this is... Whoa, wait a minute. Let me start <laughs> writing these ebooks. And so I came up with something called an ebook nation, where now all the ideas that I used to want to write about, where publishers were like, oh, I don't know about that idea. Now I'm putting them all out poetry, science fiction, uh, crazy ideas, you know what I mean? Crazy mm-hmm. stuff, all under the guise of Omar Tyree. And I'm going to sell it and sell it and sell it. If you don't like it, fine, read the other book. If you don't like this idea, fine, read the other book. But what happens when you have these ebook readers, you want to read something. And so people become addicted to reading something. And so once I'm able to attract them, then they'll download an ebook every month or every time I put a new ebook out. I said, well, instead of me putting out one book a year because the publisher don't want me swallowing up my own audience, 
I can put out 12 books a year, a book every daggone month, because the e-book readers will read it and then wait for you, and it's only causing them, what, three, four dollars to, to order it, five, six dollars. So, so they're saving money, and they're still getting that fetish of reading. I said, wow, this is amazing. And so I'm jumping up and down with this e-book thing, and I plan to utilize it to the hilt. So you're more excited about e-book nation than you were about becoming a best-selling author. <laughs> Let's go to James no, and I'm Hampton. not going to say that. I'm not going <laughs> to say that. <laughs> because there are things of being a best-selling author Absolutely. when you do the travel. <laughs> when you do it, it wasn't about being a best-selling author, but when I traveled and the fans showed up, and they were in droves in Brooklyn. They were in yeah. droves in, in Bronx, New York. They were in droves in Philadelphia and Washington, D.C. and, and uh, uh, Mississippi. When I went to an event in Mississippi, I was like, wow. <laughs> went to an event in Alabama, events in Chicago or Houston. So getting the chance to see the people was, was what really excited me. That about like, that. When I could see the people come out and say, oh, my, I love your work. I really was inspired by this. And it's lines of people. That was the thing that was more exciting for me than just making a list. When the people come out and respond to you, and that's what I write for anyway. I want that response from the people to say, hey, this is a mm-hmm. great idea. I learned a lot from this. Thanks. When are you coming out with the next one? Absolutely. And so that's what I got for being a New York Times bestseller, more so than just seeing my name on the list. I, that, it was more about the people coming out to see you. That I hear you. Let's talk to James in Hampton. Hi, James. You're Hi. on the air. Hi. Hi. Yeah. I'm going to talk to you, Arthur. Help me, help me out with my book. I've got a book. I've uh, I've had it copyrighted, protected, um, but um, I'm told from research that I've done that it's good to have an agent because I've got a full-time job and I have time to market it. And you can always publish it. i got publishers trying to get me to publish my book, but they want you to send them money and, and they could be sta- the books could be stacked up in your, your garage. So uh, I'd like to know if uh, Omar Tyree has, a, has an agent. Right. Oh my. Well, they, the money grubbers, that's a new business that started up. But typically, if they're asking you for money, that's not the legitimate agency. Typically, if they are excited enough about your work, they typically will shop it around to the people they already know in the publishing industry, and they get a percentage off the sale. But that's why it's so hard to get legitimate agents, because if they don't have a lot of confidence in your work, they don't want to deal with shopping it around because they're going to get a bunch of no's. But most agents who are professionals, they already have contacts at the publishers where they have a database of uh, maybe like 20 different editors that they can call up right now or email right now. And so they know exactly what these editors are looking for and what the publishing houses will publish. And if they know that your book can find a publisher, they will snatch it up without asking you for a dime. So the individuals who ask for money, there's money grubbers. You know, they understand that people are desperate to put their works out. And I'm not saying that they can't get you a deal, but that's typically not how it's done. Now, I have a, a service that I do, a consultation service also on my website. I have Publishing 101 where I talk about the basics. I have a master's degree program where I get into my intimate contacts and, and positions over 20 years of publishing and editing. And then I have a, a Ph.D. degree where I actually help people to write their work. And each one of them have a different price tag. But you can find out about those programs at my website, omartyree.com. And the Tyree is T-Y-R-E-E.com. And I can tell you all that information. But, again, this is a service now because I've been asked certain questions for years. And after a while, you say, don't just give this away for free. This is a business. You've earned it over 20 years of experience. And so make sure that you become valuable for it. Okay, thank you so much for the call, James. We appreciate it. it. Uh, Daisha joins us from Virginia Beach. I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Hello? Hello? Yes, you're on the air. Hi, ma'am. It's Geisha. Like oh, Geisha. Geisha I apologize. Yeah. Oh, you're fine. I'm used to it. Um, I just wanted to say I was listening to the program, and I find it very fascinating. And now I've got to read the traveler books because I'm an avid reader, and now you've got piqued my interest. But um, I adopted my sister's six kids when her life fell apart. And um, in the process of raising all these children, I've moved around the country in different areas. And the one thing that I run into in every segment of the country with my people, the black people culture, is they all live in boxes. If you're in L.A., they've never left L.A. If you're in Virginia, they've never left Virginia. And they're always surprised when they talk to my children. They've had all these different experiences. And I'm trying to instill that in my kids. And I'm running into where um, with my children as they hit the teenage years, they're picking up on the fear of, exploration from all of their peers because none of their peers or their parents or any of their family members do anything. And how do you combat that? Omar, you want to respond? 
Well, again, uh, I was a fearless individual, and I'm writing about fearless characters. And so one of the things, one of the most famous books that I've written, Fly Girl, it was uh, interesting because this girl took a lot of chances to do what she wanted to do and to go where she wanted to go. When I wrote the sequel book to Fly Girl, where she actually went to Hampton University and finished school, and then she got a master's degree, and then she flew out to Hollywood to become a Hollywood writer. A whole lot of girls that read the first book when she was still a teenager in Philadelphia, they could relate. There's the famous word, they could relate. But when she went to college, it happened away from Philadelphia. And then when she flew out to California to set up roots in California, away from Philadelphia and away from Virginia and Hampton, a lot of individuals who read the sequel book, oh, I can't relate to her now. I'm not in college. I'm not out in college. I said, you got to be kidding me. Are you kidding me? You guys have to understand that nobody that makes it in Hollywood are born in Hollywood. Most of the people in Hollywood travel from Louisville or travel from Kentucky or travel from Texas, white, black, and Asian. The people who live in Hollywood already are the ones who are kids of these people who they can't get a job out there because they're not the hungry, talented people who are coming out there with a dream and a vision to make it happen. So, and Omar- so if these kids continue to walk around with no confidence and no courage and no ambition and vision, and this is what Marion Barry talked about all the time, big visions and big dreams. If you don't have that and the parent can't instill that, and these kids, they don't pick it up from somewhere, they're not going to be anything big and they're not going to do anything major. And so it's about getting past that fear of, you know, the cool syndrome where everybody's being cool and not doing anything. You know what I mean? Like, look here, sometimes you're not going to be cool, but you're going to be the most talked about. They may call you crazy for some time. They call me crazy when I've talked about writing books. But once you become successful at what you do, then they sit back and admire you and say, I wish I could do that. Mm -hmm. And so we just have to have more of these kids that hear more success stories and individuals talk about not being afraid to go there to travel, to move across the world, you know what I mean, to to take up a new friendship, to take up a new trade instead of doing the relatable thing. That is really killing African Americans. I can relate to this. Stop relating so much and start getting out there and finding out something new that you can do. So, Omar, do you think that this is part of your your mission in life, then, is to actually expose people who may not have the opportunity to get out there and enjoy life to experience it? All day long. That's what I talk about with the Mm -hmm. travel series. Mm -hmm. I've been to Dubai. I've seen it. I can talk about it now. So you can interview me for hours about Dubai. I'm going to write a book about it. It's coming out in October. Welcome to Dubai. Mm -hmm. I've been to Kentucky. I know that they're crazy about basketball in that state. They really are. I've been to Costa Rica. I've been to Florida. I've been to uh, Jamaica. You know, I wanted to write several Jamaican movies and stories about Jamaica. I'm still going to put those in the raft because I now have the e-book thing where I can write what I want. I want to go to Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. I can't wait to see all those African-American or Afro-Brazilian people with all those mixed races and exotic looks in Brazil. I can't wait to go to South Africa, to Cape Town, to Johannesburg. You know, there's so many things. And we think about this small, little, tiny place that we live in as if that's the end. Man, are you... Look at the globe, spin it around and say, where do I want to go and go there? And so, yeah, it's just a dangerous thing where people, that their minds don't expand like that. But with this series, The Traveler, I'm going to bring them to it. I'm going to go to China, and I'm going to write about Shanghai. I can't wait to go there. They're saying Shanghai is the new place of, of Chinese just blowing up. I want to mm-hmm. go and see what it looks like. I want to go to Japan, where they have the tallest buildings in the world. They have taller buildings than New York and Japan. I want to see that stuff. And so, yeah, I'm just interested and curious, and that's why I'm a writer. I've always been curious. What is the story of what's going on here? Let me investigate it and write it for you guys. Mm -hmm. And that's what I've been doing. So people call me a fiction writer, but trust me, I've been writing factual material since day one. The only part that makes it fiction is that I can create my own characters and put them in the book. Got you. When you write for your e-books, when you write e-books, do you write differently than when you write a, a traditional novel? Yeah, the subject change. Like with science okay. fiction, if I went to a publisher and say, I want to put out a science fiction book, they say, oh, boy, you have an urban audience. They don't read science fiction. We don't want to publish that because now their money is on the line. You see how it changes? Mm-hmm. But if I put it out as an e-book, I say, all right, what well, didn't cost me nothing. I just got a cover design. I had to pay an editor. Okay, I spent $800. Let me put this e-book out. Now if the people like it and I make more, hundred, more than $800, I make money. But mm-hmm. I've been making thousands of dollars off the of e-books for the last two years, and I only have four books done right now because I'm still working on this Marion Berry book. As soon as I finish this book with the Traveler series intact, I'm going to start putting out at least an e-book every other month. 
Now, you're talking about 40, 50 e-books. Now, some people say, well, Omar, you're going to overrun the market. They can't read all that. Yes, they can. I wrote a book called, or read a book, rather, called The Long Tail. And it explained that the more product you put out for hungry people, the more they will buy. And as long as you own all of the product, I don't care if you buy A through Z, it's still coming to Omar Tyree at the end of the day. So I can put out anything I want to put out now. I can put out horror stuff. I can put out sexual stuff. And all I have it as a part of it. And then what, what I did, if you go to my website again and check out the ebook nation I'm talking about, I have it in six different categories because I do know that some people, let's say you're a Christian. Oh, more, I don't want to read about this stuff. So I make sure I got a category where I say, okay, well, you read about my romance stuff over here. Well, you don't go over to the other stuff that's the horror stuff. And I don't want you to go. And so I have it in categories where I have six different categories to make sure if you don't want to read certain things, don't go over to that Omar Tyree book, but you can read these books over here. And that way, I get all the people instead of people that say, well, I don't read Omar Tyree because he don't write what I like. Mm -hmm. I like everything, and now I have an opportunity to write everything because no publisher is in the way saying, well, I'm not going to put my dollar on that. I can put my dollar on anything I want. So, Omar, what is your process when you are about to write? I mean, do you do you devote a certain amount of hours per day to writing, or do you just do it when the inspiration hits you? How does that work? Yeah, that's a good question. I call myself a passion writer. Mm -hmm. Now, I start with an outline. I know where I want to start. I know where I want to finish. And then I fill out the in-between. But if I feel like writing eight hours in one day and I have the time to do it and I'm feeling it, I'm going to write eight hours. And Mm -hmm. so when I hear writers say, oh, I write six hours a day, what if you don't fill up the writing that day? Are you going to waste four hours sitting there daydreaming? I just don't get that. And so I hear them say that, but the reality is that's a concept that they're pushing to you. Mm -hmm. Even writers that say they write six hours a day, they're going to end up wasting some of those hours, and sometimes they're going to end up writing more than that. So what they're saying is that I try to write an average of six hours a day, but that means that all those hours aren't really beneficial hours. I don't really like to do that. I like to enjoy myself, enjoy my life, enjoy my family, go outside. So if I'm not feeling it, I'm not going to force myself to sit there an extra four hours if it ain't coming out of me that day. Mm -hmm. Now, the next day, if I'm feeling it, and i got friends who want to do things, I'll tell them, look here, I'm working on my book, and spend extra time. And so as a passion writer, I don't stick to that straight hours thing that people talk about. However, at the end of the day, and I tell all writers who are aspiring, I finish what I start. And that's what I'm definitely going to do. So even though I may not have consistent hours, if I know I need to finish this chapter by Friday, I will finish that chapter by Friday. So you give yourself a deadline when you start a book as in, in terms of when you want it to be finished. Yeah, well, you know, again, mm-hmm. I'm a journalist, so I had deadlines. Okay. I'm used okay. to deadlines. Now, mm-hmm. when you have people who are, this is the difference again. You have English writers and you have journalists. Journalists are used to deadlines, are used to getting it done and turning it in. You have English writers who may spend three years working on a book. I will never spend three years working on a book. I want to get it out. You know, so now some English writers are the ones that get the, you know, they, they get the writing awards and all that, but then you have an audience that say, I don't understand what was going on. It gets more analytical, metaphorical, not saying I can't write that way, but typically I want to write about current affairs and things that are going on right now with normal people and not get into all these uh, crazy creative ways of telling a sentence. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I'm like, uh, I'm not getting that. D- I can do that way, but I'm like, you know what? I'm more interested in the person than how elaborate my sentence was. So you know what I mean? Elaborate this this great elaborate paragraph. Great, but what did it say about the person you're writing about? So I'm more of a contemporary writer that wants to write about the person. Now, I'm going to write good. I'm a quality writer now. I'm not saying my stuff is garbage as far as the paragraph and sentence structure, but I'm not going to spend five and six days trying to have a perfect, you know, paragraphic (laughs) flow. I still want to be more concerned about the characters. And so we tend to put out books faster and more often where you really into reading the characters and the action. Okay. So Kohler Books is publishing your Traveler series. They are based here in Virginia Beach. Um, So how did you connect with them? We got about three minutes left in the conversation. I have a manager, Raul Davis, who Mm -hmm. was searching out there. He understood the idea. Raul Davis travels a lot. ASG, uh, Center Strategy Group. He travels just like I travel, and he loved the idea. Oh, Mar, that's a great idea. And we tried to shop this idea in 2005. We shopped it in 2006. We shopped it in 2007. We shopped it in 2000. He finally found somebody that said, hey, we love the idea, too. 
Mm-hmm. Okay, let's see if we can put something together and make it happen. I said, we'll do it, but first we have to put out an e-book because we have to warm up the audience to it. And so that's where I came up with this no turning back idea so you can learn the character and what we're doing with it and start an audience from scratch. And so at first the publisher was like, I don't know about the e-book. I said, trust me, that's where it is right now. You want to warm the audience first. You don't just want to put something out there cold. Let the audience know what you're doing first and then get them addicted to it and then they keep rocking and rolling with you and then we can put the e-book out as a regular book. And so we put the e-book out in January. It started off slow, but I told the publishers, I said, that's where it always going to start off. Nobody knows about it yet. Let them start talking about it. Let it spread like a virus, and then they'll be ready for the new book when it comes out in October. Then it'll spread again. Then they'll be ready for the new book when it comes out in 2014. Then it'll spread again. And so you have to do it the old word-of-mouth way. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're doing with No Turning Back, the first book in the Traveler series, which you can order right now at (laughs) Amazon.com and BarnesandNobles.com and I book and all the other places where you order ebooks. You know what, Omar? Beyond being an excellent writer, and I have read your work, and you are an excellent writer, but you are also an incredible marketer. I will give you Thank that. You. <laughs> Very much so. So the book is called The Traveler, No Turning Back. And then The Traveler, Welcome to Dubai will be out this fall. Is that correct? October. In October. Okay. We really appreciate you being a guest on Another View today. Tell us your website one more time. Omar, O-M-A-R, Tyree, T-Y-R-E-E dot com. And the Traveler series is mm-hmm. the Traveler Books, plural, dot com. The Traveler Books dot com. I have read yep. the uh, excerpt from uh, No That's Turning Back. That's where you Back. got the excerpt. You got yes. my bio. You got the book cover designs. You got the welcome to the bio. We have uh, students who travel around the world, students from uh, Delaware University who've been traveling. They're, they're ambassadors. So okay. we want people to understand that whole concept of travel. And, and ironically, all of them are white girls. Okay. You know, so it's one of those I would love to have some black folks who travel and would, would love to be on the website as well. But that's what we're working against. Okay. And we got to run out right now. But thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate it. And we'll be you right back. <laughs> I'm Claude McKnight of Group Take 6, and you're listening to Another View, Fridays at noon at WHRV 89.5 FM. And welcome back. You may know him as the menacing drug kingpin Alton in the Oscar-nominated film The Blind Side, or maybe as T-Dog in one of the cable's highest-rated shows, The Walking Dead. Our Lisa Godley caught up with the actor and now author, Iron E. Singleton. With a unique name like Iron E, we wanted to know how he came up with it and what it means. Yeah, uh, I have several meanings to that thing. It's like um, Iron E. You know, I came up with the term, and uh, it, it means uh, an eagle, which is what the capital E means at the end of iron. An eagle in flight with an unbroken spirit. It means that, amongst other things, like it could be, depending on my mood for that day, it could be energetic, it could be enigmatic, it could be electrifying. Also, we, we know Irony. With the Y, uh, lowercase Y at the end, to mean that which is not expected. You know, you, you don't expect a kid from the project who didn't have his father in his life, who lost his mother from HIV and lost many other friends coming up. And my brother, with him being in and out of the prison system. Landing his first major role in one of the biggest sports movies of all time, The Blind Side, Iron E had the opportunity to act opposite Sandra Bullock. Michael was here. Yeah, but you tell him I'll be seeing him around. Oh, he gonna get his. So Michael was here. Last night, gonna come by here and sneak me there and run off. Yeah, tell him to sleep with one eye open. And being on The Walking Dead, the biggest, one of the biggest cable shows, second biggest basic cable television show in history, it's ironic that I am I'm here today, you know, to, to, to have had these experiences. So, hence irony. In The Walking Dead, he plays the compassionate, tough guy, T-Dog. We gotta turn around. Straight back to that hurt? Oh, no. The highway's back there. That's where they'll be. Rick will go back to where we first broke down in Glen, too. We're headed east. Get to the coast. We should have done that from the jump. But we've got a shot to get out of here in one piece. I gotta find Carl. They may have escaped with somebody. I hate to say it, but they're on their own. There's no way to even begin to start looking. You're wrong. Look. 
we can't go back. I'm sorry, it's suicide. We asked him to share a memorable moment from the set. Wow, just too many, just too many. But, uh, you know, instantly, the one that comes to mind is probably the talks, the, the several, the many talks I had with Jeffrey DeMond. You know, he was he was kind of like uh, the patriarch of, of, of the pack. Um, that father figure, and given that my father was not there in my life, uh, I kind of I cherish those moments. We just had really memorable conversations, talking about his kids and talking about my kids, and and the stuff you need to do to make sure the kids stay in line and to stay right or whatever. But but uh, yeah, we had many of those conversations. They just kind of stuck out to him because he's such a, a a great soul, you know, great, very kind human being, very thoughtful. Amongst others with the, the rest of the cast members, I had a special moment with seemingly everybody, you know, Lincoln, Andrew Lincoln plays Rick and so many of the other cast members. It was a special time for me. Irony also recently released Blindsided by The Walking Dead, his autobiography, which covers it all. From growing up in the drug-infested streets of Atlanta to graduating from the University of Georgia to landing numerous roles in film and TV, we found out what motivated him to take on this project. Uh, God and, and all of humanity inspired me to. I felt like it was my duty to tell my story, which is what the book is about. And also uh, lots of amusing anecdotes about my time on the set of The Walking Dead and also the set of The Blind Side. You know, uh, I went through all those tests for a reason, you know, so that I could have a testimony to share with others in hopes to, in hopes to inspire other people. You know, if we don't inspire others, who, who, who is? Who is going to do it? We have to do that for each other. It was it was a great experience because my uh, co-writer, Juliet Terzieff, she was fantastic. She hung out with me and the family for about a week. We drove all around Atlanta. We drove to my, my uh, the University of Georgia where I went to school and uh, hung out there. And she, she's uh, an, an excellent writer. She did, you know, a phenomenal job in in, in bringing out my vision the way, the way I saw it. For Another View, I'm Lisa Godley. And the story you just heard was produced by Danielle Jenkins, who interned with us this semester. She graduates this month from Regent University. Congratulations to you, Danielle. Time now for things to view and do in Hampton Roads. You will be my Saturday love. The Virginia Department of Health is producing a special edition of its program, Health Watch, called Autism Spectrum Disorder, A Personal Perspective. The program is produced at our WHRO television studios. You're invited to join the studio audience. To reserve your seat, call 757-683-8836. If you know of a Newport News youth who excels in community service, leadership, and citizenship, why not nominate him or her for the Newport News Mayor's Youth Citizen of the Year Award. You can nominate any high school freshman, sophomore, or junior who is a resident of Newport News. The winner will serve as an ambassador for the city and the official youth spokesperson. Call 369-6808 for nomination forms. Hampton Roads Committee of 200 Plus Men invites you to its annual Scholars Breakfast, honoring more than 500 outstanding African American male high school seniors. The breakfast is Saturday, May 18th at 9 at the Hampton Roads Convention Center in Hampton. Call 455-9260 for details. And the Quality of Life Corporation invites you to attend a celebration for ordinary people doing extraordinary things on Saturday, May 18th from 6 until 8 at Scott Dozier Hall on the campus of Norfolk State University. Call 610-0108 for reservations. And Another View congratulates Ms. Delcino Miles of the Miles Agency and Ms. Brenda Andrews of the New Journaling Guide as two of the extraordinary people doing extraordinary things. These and other events are on our website, anotherviewradio.org. You can find podcasts of our show, sign up for our eView newsletter, or drop us a line to let us know how we're doing. Next week, it's time for the Another View Roundtable. For producer Lisa Godley, audio engineer Perry Smith, Danny Epperson, who answered our phones, I'm Barbara Ham Lee. Have a fantastic weekend. And let's get together again next Friday at noon for another view.